Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I, I am the privacy and security co-chair of this forum. And um, we've taken a lot of efforts to bring great people into this forum. Um, two of them couldn't make it uh, due to various reasons. And um, I thought I will, I will get started talking about each of our lovely panelists we have. And then I'll take you through what I would call um, PCI DSS 101. Uh, it's a set of slides we put together just to introduce the topic uh, so people understand what it is. Um, people can kind of relate to what it is. I think all of us in the room will be able to understand very quickly once I go through the slides, what are we talking about? So that's something that I thought we'll, we'll get started on. Um, and then we'll get to the panelists. Uh, so what is, what is um, PCI and why PCI uh, in the hospital setting? Uh, that's, the, that's the whole uh, theme here. And um, it's, not, it's not just PCI in hospital, it's just PCI for everybody. So if you look at uh, the folks we have on, on the podium here, we got Robert Pittman, uh, the far end, uh, who's the CISO of County of Los Angeles. I'm sure he can talk a lot about uh, um, what's happening in this area. Um, we've got um, Cynthia, who is a, a person who really want to talk to when uh, you have a problem. Uh, an attorney who works in this area delivers internal controls. And then we've got Bill. Uh, Bill actually is, um, we've got a vendor person just to get, to give you an understanding of what they're doing as well in this space. Kind of give you, gives you a broader perspective. So I'm going to take you through a very quick set of slides. We don't want to be these people. but we want to be this person. I'm not going to hospital facility because I'm looking great, I'm feeling great, because I want something done. I'm not keeping well. We, want, we don't want people to pull their head out because they gave you your credit card to make a payment for service, and somebody did something with the cards, and you have to go and rip it up in the middle. So what, what we can do as security folks in this area is what PCI is all about. This will give you another example. We've got on the left-hand side on top what things we can typically do as uh, security folks in this area. Uh, we can verify, we can, do, uh, we, can access, we can have access controls, policies, procedures, and we'll talk about all of that in the next few slides. And we can avoid what we call hospital havoc. We can also avoid somebody just taking their wallet or using their credit card wrongly and giving it to the wrong person. And we are trying to basically put in a lock on the creek on the credit card, figuratively speaking. So what's the goals of PCI DSS? Nothing, something that we did not know. It's not something that we would not do as just simple security professionals. Build and maintain a secure network so people don't steal the data. Uh, protect the data because it's in your environment right now. Maintain a vulnerability management program so you have a structured process to make sure all the vulnerabilities are addressed as and when it's executed. Implement strong access controls right, standard stuff, what we would do. Regularly monitor and test these networks because some of us put in the network and figure out, well, it should stay, but typically doesn't because somebody else takes it over and you don't know somebody else did. And then you maintain a simple information security policy. That's the broad goals of PCI. So it is, not, it is nothing different, nothing fabulous from what you would do anyway. But we did this because now the banks who actually have all of the credit card information in their possession realized that this is something they needed to do. And they, are, they went together, Visa, American Express, Discover, joined together 
and MasterCard and put together something that we could all look at and say, okay, we are going to subscribe to these standards. That's PCI, DSS. So it, it's basically broken down into 12 security requirements. And I'll briefly walk you through all of these. And this is, should be familiar to almost everybody here. What do you mean by a secure network? Maintain a firewall configuration to protect data. Not a big deal. We do it today. Do we do it today in cognizant of the fact that that is protecting credit card data? Maybe not. But that's what we're being asked to do. Make sure that when you have transactions being processed, it is going through a firewall configured protected data environment. This is something we all preach. Vendor supply defaults. We talk about vendor supply defaults. We talk about don't use this and don't do that. But this is what is basically we are, we are kind of highlighting as part of this process as well. Protect cardholder data. We all understand what is PHI. This is a different type of PHI. That is all. But this is data that we need to protect it by storing it, managing it, and delivering it in a structured, secure manner, like transmission of cardholder data. Very simple process, very easily understood, but sometimes we just think it's nominal. It is common. It's, that's something we need to figure out a little bit more. And we've been asked to do that through PCI. Vulnerability management program, important. People don't assume that putting in antivirus in every PC, every endpoint, is part of your vulnerability management program. It is. They just think it's just security. It's not security. It is preventing vulnerability at, through various means that we've seen, not just in terms of how the software is written, but how people can break into the software and pull the data out of it. That's what so antivirus does too. So putting in antivirus, not a big deal. Develop and maintain secure systems and applications. This is important because we want to make sure we have different levels of code checks we can perform as we write security, as we write applications. This is something that we can do. And if there is credit card information there, make sure you have some level of security application process built in. Uh, um, later today, uh, Richard Greenberg is going to talk about making security part of the fabric. It's, it's, this, is, this is all part of the fabric. It's something that we've talked about before. Strong access control measures. Uh, restrict access to data by business need to know. Assign a unique ID. Nothing, nothing phenomenal. Physical access to God all data. Sometimes this is a, a factor that we forget. We as information security officers have a lot of belief in protecting software, protecting net technology, protecting networks. We may or may not consider physical security as an important aspect of it. PCI framework forces you to look at physical security. Track and monitor all access to network resources. Uh, this is what I would look at in terms of doing any monitoring across the board. And uh, test security systems. We are having a test today, right, Jim? Two o'clock? Yes. Somebody is doing a test today for this facility. So this facility is being tested for, for what? for disaster recovery VCP. But why wouldn't that apply in the same form to cardholder data? Same thing. We got to test, measure, make sure we can remediate some of the issues that we find, and it's okay. Security policy. Everybody thinks security policy is a piece of paper. Everybody understands it's more than a piece of paper. It's more than a piece of paper if adhere to. I have seen companies where there are policies and policies and policies. And we all know policies are great to read, but difficult to enforce. Extremely difficult to enforce. I've been in situations where you can write whatever you want in a policy, but it's very difficult to figure out how do you enforce them. 
because they, they, everybody can come up with the best words. I, I guarantee it. We are the pioneers in, in English literature when it comes to writing security policies. I, 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 I've been through this before. But try to figure out how to explain that to people, number one. That means train, educate, and deliver. Right? Second thing is put in place those controls, in, uh, not just in, in, in the software, but in the networks, in, in the routers, and the switches, and the applications that you write, and also in, very simply, the databases that we use. So all of that stuff, it's, it's, it's the implementation of the policy that creates some challenges. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to ask some of our panelists to now introduce themselves and also talk about what they are doing in this area. And then we go into a, a level of, uh, I'm going to open up the, the floor for questions. I'm sure a lot of you guys have a lot of questions to these brilliant folks we have on the panel. And then uh, we, can, we can get started on having a dialogue. Uh, guys, I want to make this as open as possible. We've got a lot of uh, conversation we can have around this. Um, it's not a new topic, and it's not an old topic either, because this framework has changed at least twice now. So let's talk about what is it that's going to happen. So I'm going to go back to this slide. Uh, Robert Pittman, uh, maybe you can introduce yourself and talk a little bit about uh, PCI. Hello. All okay. right. So again, I'm Robert Pittman. I'm the County of Los Angeles Chief Information Security Officer. Uh, let me just make a couple points on PCI, but let me start off and kind of give you a, a little thumbnail sketch of who the county is. People get county and city uh, confused. So the city of LA is one of the 88 cities that comprise County of Los Angeles. The County of Los Angeles is the largest county populace wise in the nation. Uh, it's around 11 million plus citizens. We employ over 102 employees, about 80% of those employees are represented by a labor union. We have over 80 labor unions, from physicians to custodians, nurses, uh, even uh, sheriff deputies, law enforcement. Uh, my purview is over 34 major departments, uh, which is, let's say, health, Department of Health Services, which has five uh, hospital facilities, range from 120 beds to about 680 beds. Uh, and, and over 30 comprehensive health care centers. Uh, so I have a health care cluster with Department of Mental Health and Public Health. Uh, there's a social services sector, Department of uh, Public Social Services, Child Support Services. There's another sector for uh, general government, public works, assessor, uh, treasurer, tax collector that I'm going to speak to shortly. Uh, and, and then CIO, CO. So it's 34 major departments. All the departments you can look at from a corporate perspective as being 34 lines of businesses. 34 lines of businesses. However, I would suggest to you that all those 34 departments have some level of confidential or sensitive data. So the whole security program in the county is established minimum security standards across the board. If the sheriffs, because of CGIS, um, which is DOJ requirements could be more stringent because of that federal red, then so be it, HIPAA, uh, et cetera. PCI, I started to dabble in PCI way back in 01, 02 as a uh, internally hosted strategy. We launched one application, you're gonna like this because I didn't mention a department, but if I say it, you'll probably figure it out what department, skeleton is in a closet. Not because Halloween was yesterday. This is the actual website. This is from the Department of Coroner. And back during the early 2000s, this was this parallel the CSI TV series. And the Coroner website for e-commerce is a point of sale. It's a gift shop. Body bags, silhouettes of beach towels. There are huge sellers mugs, pin, black pins with white silhouettes on it, huge uh, uh, sales from around the world, mind you. So we get sales internationally hitting our website as well as domestic United States. 
after about two or three years, and this was PCI 1.0, now I think PCI is up to 2, 2.5 or so, um, it's very expensive to go through a annual PCI certification, even with that one application back in 2001. So one of my more intelligent uh, strategies that has worked, we outsource e-commerce platform, uh, essentially move that liability over to an external hosted vendor in 2006 through a competitive solicitation. With that, uh, there's a lot of checks and balances in, in terms of them demonstrating their PCI DSS or data security standard uh, wherewithal, where that uh, when there is a department that has a desire to stand up a web application, i.e. e-commerce for electronic payment processing, there's, even back then in 06, when we had the foresight to require uh, a vulnerability assessment of the environment, including the application, prior to that application being uh, implemented um, on behalf of that department. One of the things we wanted to be looking at, and I don't want to get into the minutia, but you know, we have to be concerned about the security level of the application. We was concerned about where was the credit card information stored? Is it stored on a session cookie? Is it stored on a persistent cookie or a non-persistent cookie? We got down to that level of detail uh, back in 06. So we have this hosted environment. Uh, since 06, we now have about over 20, I believe, e-commerce application in, in the county. It, it ranges from water bills from Department of Public Works. Uh, there's an auction book for those uh, distressed properties from the Treasurer Tax Collector. But the one biggest application that we gained the biggest bang in terms of convenience fees and convenience to the uh, 11 million citizens is the acceptance of payment of property taxes. $925 million transverse our network in this last tax season, 925 million in property taxes. That infrastructure has to be secure, meaning that my concept is if the transaction is $2 at a, to buy five pins from the corner or uh, a property payment of $5,000 or $10,000 for that first supplement, it has to be secure because if I perform a man in middle attack, I could simply change the $10 to $2,000. So security has to be in place, and, and that leads to um, one of the standards. This is point number one. Um, there's this thing called address verification system. And, and what we standardize on is all of our e-commerce application will validate the address and zip code. Now. When you go to gas stations, uh, when you put in your car, hopefully there's no skimmer there on the gas pump that uh, they ask you to enter your zip code. So that's just one level of uh, to reduce fraud. But our standard is to validate the address and zip code with the credit card number. Most of our applications have that as default. The second level of AVS is to use the CBV code. Um, the CBV is that three-digit code on back of your Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. However, for whatever reason, maybe because of hype and security, Amex or American Express has a four-digit code and it's on the front of the card. I just have an a issue with that, which maybe we, we can talk to, is this that I just believe that there's a concern with our, I have a concern with our merchants and not validating if the card is signed if the credit card is signed. So by the CBV being on the front of the car, the clerk, the cashier never turns, ha have no need to turn it over to validate it. None of my credit cards are signed. What it says is, please request driver's license. But probably in the last 10 years for all the shopping I do in a retail store or restaurant, maybe two uh, retailers are actually you know, turn over the car and ask for that. So it's, you know, I'm not sure if it's all PCI, it's probably more on the merchant side. 
Uh, but anyway, that's the second tier is the, the validation of CVV. The third tier, uh, we had to use it with one particular application in the county, and, and it's called velocity or volume check. Now, this is uh, the sheriff's department, and, and this, uh, when there's an inmate, they have trust accounts, and a loved one who is not incarcerated, right, they could put 50, up to $50 into their account. Well, knowing that there's inmates, and we have one of the most crowded or overcrowded jail systems or county jails in the nation, there seemed to be a correlation between their loved ones that's incarcerated and their uh, family or relatives that's outside of jail and using fraudulent cards. We was getting a high percentage of rejects. We was getting a high percentage of credit cards that was being used that was stolen. We was getting a, a high volume of credit cards that was um, crediting $50 into this inmate's account from outside of this state, outside of this country. So I mean, that, that was just, so anyway, we had to institute a velocity check. This is the third and highest level check where that we only allow, and this has, this is where your business rules come into play. Because a family member or loved one can uh, uh, implement $50 as a max number. So what we decided was the lid is $100 for 30 days, essentially two transactions. So if they have two individuals uh, incarcerated, then that's $50 to one person, $50 to the other person, and that's it for 30 days. So the point is we have we had to reduce our fraud and chargebacks because that's a cost that incurred to the county, which is the taxpayers that pay my salaries and, and all the hundred and two thousand plus employees in a county. So that's the address verification system. Uh, also, well, when I talk about AVS, it's specific from the web. A, a request, you know, for, for a gift shop like the coroner. Uh, or payment to a incarcerated uh, uh, inmate. Uh, that's through the web, but we also use the IVR, the Interactive Voice Recognition System. And, and we use that regardless of um, vo voice over IP or just a regular landline. Uh, we have the checks and balances in there uh, to use the IVR. And then my last point to, before I give it to my esteemed colleagues here is uh, the point of sale devices, the card swipe devices. We have, I have another department, animal care and control. Now you have to, uh, PCI touch on it a little bit, but you really got to be aware of the physical security. For example, uh, animal care control is, is the department that where you have to pay fees for your cat and dogs. Let me have a sidebar conversation on this one. How many believe that animal care control dogs and cats will actually have confidential information? Anybody with show of hands? So not many. Well, they do have confidential and sensitive information. Politicians, Hollywood stars, pro athletes do not want their name and address associated to their pets or even their pet's name. I have a scenario for each department. It's a very unique job I have. <laughs> So, uh, but the point is, uh, if you have a uh, point of sale device uh, at the window, the question is, who do you want to swipe the card? Uh, do you want the, the point of sale device within, uh, on this side of the window where that me, the county employee, takes the individual card and swipe it, give it back? Or do you want to have the device on the doggo and have it outside the window, short strap, where that, the, the customer swipe the card? You really got to pay attention to that because you really, I don't want my employees, because my employees are not bonded, they're, they're not insured, I don't really want to entertain that discussion. So at least animal care control is the customer that has to swipe the card. And, and it's an analogy to the, the supermarket concept. When you go to supermarket, you swipe your card, it's, it's before you, but then if it doesn't work, the cashier would turn a device around, do something, intercode or something, 
and then turn it back and say, well, swipe it again, right? So same concept, but organizationally, we have to reduce that liability. And I could go on on some other tidbits, but I'm sure I want to give uh, equal time to my colleagues. Uh, thank you. That was, so you covered from Karner to Pets. Okay. Cynthia, where you want to take this? The legal aspect. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I have a very interesting job. I'm not what most people think of a lawyer as. Um, I, uh, I ran the data lab for a, ma a nationwide election study in graduate school and did disaster response. So I figured out how to get the people out of the flood zone. Today, when you see me texting, I'm dealing with the East Coast, OK? When the World Trade Center came down, I was talking to people in the biz building. What I do for a living is I help businesses and governments manage people and process. And I have a technology and data background. My husband is one of the lead design engineers for the secured communications on Air Force One. So my system is secured to that standard because that's the only standard he trusts and he doesn't think it's good enough. So you take two of us and we're colossally paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I'm in a perfect role is because I'm paid to be paranoid. You pay me lots of money to do it if you're, if you're smart on the front end. What I do is I talk with people about what the law is, what the law should be, within that box created by the law, what the reality is, because nobody can do everything, what the gaps are between what the law is and where the risk really lies, mm -hmm. and how you want to operate within that. And then on the front end, what we do is we teach you to document that for defensibility because, pardon my language, shit happens. And that's the next part of it. But actually, most of the time, people come to me the front end because crap has happened and things go wrong. So I've done data breach and other kinds of mitigation response, not just on PCI, which was the original problem, was personal financial information because that was before HIPAA. And in that day, HIPAA privacy was really <coughs> common law community privacy standards, which if you look and Googled me, you see I was out here 10, 20 years ago where I went to law school and for years after talking about privacy, privacy in the trenches and the like. And then it was common law pricing, revealing embarrassing private facts. You know, stars can sue you for that, and it's a lot more expensive than a HIPAA violation. And then we thought about financial information, Graham Leach, Bliley, the data breach theirs. For many years, I've been the Secret Services spokesperson for cybercrime and data security. I've worked on HIPAA here and privacy in 50 other countries. So I can tell you what the rules for the government, and I get to go and I lead the meetings with the Office of Civil Rights, talking about why the privacy rules do and don't work, how stupid the regs are, and why they don't understand that none of this stuff works, because it takes three transactions to do the interchange, and all of those people have been written out of the regs, and there's a gap. In other words, on the front end, I do a lot, but not a lot you'd see. On the back end, you don't see me either, because if I do my job right, hopefully you don't even see my clients, because I put on what I call my lemon yellow suit, my big Texas earrings, and I let my sun blonde hair not be covered up, and I wear a skirt on one of the few days a week. And whatever agency, when something goes bad, my first job is to stabilize. The second job is to stop the triage. Third job is to beg for mercy. So I live in the trenches with my clients, and what they know is whether you're talking about PCI on credit cards, you're talking about personal financial information, or you're talking about your trade secrets, or a million of other things that you contract every day to protect, and your vendors contract every day to protect, and your business contractors contract every day to protect, that we can write all the paper you want, but it doesn't do you a darn good a bit until you systematize it. Mm -hmm. So here's what I know. The first thing I know is you do all these standards and it doesn't do you a darn but a good because the three biggest breach things I'm dealing on right now are friendly fire breaches, and most of them are. It's a vendor who was a transaction executor on some of the biggest transactions in healthcare, millions of dollars a day, who decides to steal a database. Okay? And that database was not looking for the patient data, it was looking for the financial list of the trade secrets, but they took doctor's information, credit card information, HIPAA information, and like. And while we're litigating it, I've got to figure out how to keep us from getting nailed because somebody downstream did something that they were never supposed to do and violated the contract. And oh, by the way, their lawyer says, we're gonna, I'm not going to give you that data back. Remember, he's a business associate, a chain of custody person. He's going to put it in his safe. He had a really good time when the feds came in, right? 
this is the world you live in. This is the world I look in. So the things that come out of this is, first and foremost, it's the in and outs. You have to do all of these things, but if you do all these out and you don't do what you would call directory management, mm -hmm. you're screwed. On the outbound side, if you do directory management, but you don't audit and comply your vendor, they will screw it up and you're still screwed. So since you're probably going to have a problem, right, which is the thing, the other message I have for you is think about the assumption that you're going to have to prove it. And what I'm trying to do is to help on all of that process is to help remind you and coach you how to document as a part of continuously process, not just try to do right, but to anticipate the possibility that there might be a Sandy, a Hurricane Katrina, the World Trade Center, or just some evil actor or some more typically stupid actor. This just does something stupid, like cuts the wire like the last speaker talked about, that creates a crisis in your world. And at that moment, my job is to put the lipstick on you. And it really helps if you remember that you might have to not only have tried to do the right thing, but have some process in place for trying to mitigate so it looks like you're trying to do the right thing and capture your documentation. And so not only in telling you what the rules are, but most importantly, you all know what the rules are. The process for me is to help you understand how that evidence is going to play out and how you can behave on a day-to-day -day basis. So when something goes wrong, instead of you being on the front page of the news for being totally irresponsible, I can go and say that it was, it was Sandy. It was inevitable that we did everything that was rationally possible. We're good guys, and you should feel sorry for us. And I will point out to you that I've never had a client of mine sanctioned, but I've had some huge breaches. So that's my job. And so remember to document, and then if the sky is falling, my job is to be there in the trenches, which is why I will apologize again in advance that you don't have your paperwork, because I was in New York yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and that, uh, you know, you can remember that the process is important, but capturing the process you went through shows that you were right. Because the standards itself, there is no one perfect panacea of certification. At the end of the day, in California, in Texas, which we have the two toughest data laws in the country, in the feds, and in the court, most importantly, of public opinion, if something happens, even if you did everything you were supposed to and met all the standards, but somebody's embarrassed, you still have a common law action, or more importantly, you have a public relations breach and you are in institutions of trust. And so if somebody took the credit card information of a patient, the public will never trust you again. It's not about the law, it's about reality. Okay, so we got law, reality, where are you going to go this one, Bill? Um, I'll talk a little bit about what, uh, you know, what I see from a vendor's perspective uh, across both healthcare and finance. I'll keep it, try to keep it as specific as I can to healthcare. Um, you know, my company works on data management. We're an information security company. Uh, we work on the data governance. And again, as Cynthia says, a lot of it uh, that we find is on process, uh, working on the data governance, interoperability between your different systems in a healthcare environment. Um, we work to secure PII, HIPAA confidentiality um, is a software platform, and I'll talk less about that, but more about some of the things that you see. So we've got the holidays coming up. How many people plan to do some shopping online? Mm -hmm. Right. So, so how many people in the last two to three years have gotten notifications from their credit card company, let's say TG Maxx, a magazine, that they've gotten breached and they had to let go? So PCI is just about in every aspect of our lives. Um, just convenient from a healthcare perspective, it's part of the patient experience, right? I mean, you want to have ease of, ease of use for them to pay for services, whether in their physician's group that you have, whether they're checking out um, um, of the hospital at the end of their care. Um, your CFO is probably want to recognize revenue as quick as possible. You know, healthcare unfortunately doesn't have the same revenue margins as a lot of uh, other industries, usually two to three percent. Uh, that's not uh, too far off. So you're looking at what's the risk? Uh, what's the risk for PCI as you go across and that becomes part of um, the interoperability of any healthcare systems, any big business today? Um, how do you contain it? How do you measure it? Um, I was with Robert this past week over at um, ISSA conference in Anaheim and Dr. Capel from Dartmouth made a great uh, slide which kind of uh, made an impact on me. It was workarounds. Right? How many people walk through the healthcare organizations and you see a workaround? 
Um, he has a great picture of a screen. It looks like a laptop, and in the corner, there was a piece of tape with a big X that said, do not click, all right? So, uh, I mean, it's, it's part of every day. If you walk through a ward, you've got nurses that are uh, printing out patient information, right, so they don't have to go to collect medications every single time they go to the different um, technology to go ahead and have the, the drug dispensary. Um, you've got doctors that have, maybe they're part of Sharp, maybe they're part of Scripps, maybe they're part of Radies, and each time they have to log into a different EMR system. Are they supposed to remember that? And then they have their own practices. They've got three, four, five, six different log and IDs. Um, so when you get into PCI and PII, there's a lot of different processes, going back to what Cynthia says, that you have to look at in governing data. Um, PCI is a part of it. You've got to put um, access controls in place, maybe log monitoring. What sort of system controls do you have to really look at who's accessing the data? Do they need to access the data? You know, it can go on in horror stories about uh, an employee who had stolen financial re uh, records um, from an end-stage cancer facility, opened up some credit cards, um, started ordering electronics TVs, and by the time that patient had, you know, passed, expired, the family gets a, a bill. You know, for all these credit card statements while well, he was actually in, in end-stage end care or hospice. Um, did that person need to have access to the patient financial information to give quality of care to that patient? Um, we could look at other things that you see in the news. As recently as South Carolina, Department of Revenue. People, like Robert said, want to pay their taxes or a certain part of their taxes online. Um, 3.6 million Social Security uh, numbers compromised just last week. Um, so as much as we put firewalls and different security measures in place, um, it's still the internal threat. Uh, are, are you educating your folks? I mean, how many people just go into work, like you said, you have some workarounds, and you don't really think about it because at the end of the day, you're just trying to do your job. And this system doesn't talk to the system. This patient registry doesn't have the financial information that you need to kind of check that patient out. Um, or there's different things that you have to look at as far as priorities. You talk to the CISO and the CIO, two different priorities. Um, so how do you as security professionals, or health information management professionals, convey that same message upwards to this is actually just as important as 5010 compliance or moving towards accountable care organizations or compliance for meaningful use? Um, and I think it's just leveraging um, your colleagues and kind of looking at data governance and processes you have in place which is going to mitigate your risk. Um, and that's just some of the things that we try to work with uh, our clients on and really looking at what systems do you have in place? What kind of governance do you have in place? What kind of processes do you have in place? What are you doing with your data? You know, we specialize in the QA test and dev environments where you spend a lot of time locking down all this information in production, but then you just take a snapshot of the same information and you're giving it to outside consultants, developers, where do they really need to see PHI information, PCI information? Um, so really, again, looking at policies, procedures, processes, because at the end of the day, if that does get compromised and it does get re breached, it's going to cost substantially more into the millions of dollars what it's going to cost your organization from a trust perspective, a brand perspective, from credit monitoring for those patients or, or customers that have gotten out, a law firm like Cynthia, <laughs> which I'm sure is not cheap, and you're going to look at notifications, and, and all the different things that come along with uh, data breach or when data gets compromised. Um, so that's some of the things that we focus on and, and kind of see in the marketplace. Okay. What say you? I'm going to open up the, the podium for questions. Any questions? Anybody's got any thoughts? Um, I know there are a couple of folks who have uh, mics, right, John? Uh, we, can, we can ask the question and that'll be good to go. Okay. Go? Yep, go ahead. Um, at your level, how do you see all of your, um, what I would call enterprise level solutions, uh, helping out a ambulatory care facility with one doctor? How do you see the ramifications for them? Um, I, I think, um, again, I'll steal from the ESSA conference, right? If you can't continually, you know, from an end to end solution, uh, CYA, do what you can. What can you have control over? Obviously, a small ambulatory system with one or two doctors isn't going to be able to afford, you know, uh, 
solution from Oracle or, or, or any kind of big security solutions, but what can they do? I think it's looking at, again, looking at your policies and procedures, looking at your overall governance, and what can you control? I think that if you go before, if you, if you do get compromised and you go before any kind of regulatory body, you know, you can say at least we, you know, don't have the budget to do, you know, a multi-million dollar solution or, you know, wireless firewalls and all the other, you know, great things that you hear security folks talk about, but what did you do? Uh, what governance and policies and procedures did you have in place? Well, I actually, I would say that try probably isn't good enough because really from the HIPAA standpoint and the FACTA standpoint, you don't have to worry about the FTC in most instances. They are just really a data collector. Those are the FACTA, FINRA, those people, they're just a data collector. There's breaches every day. And, you know, I think we could save a lot on the budget. And, and this is with former partners that are on the commission, okay? So it's just that they don't do anything with it. It's such a volume. So HIPAA, you, if they don't have anything, they will sanction them and the breach notification, and they probably won't know it. So one of the things I say for small vendors is if you can't afford to do it right electronically, don't do it electronically. Burn the data, slow it down, and have your accountant come over and exit it that way. Do you see what I'm saying? So don't put it on electronically or have a dummy terminal. We do this a lot with Dennis, for example. Have a dummy terminal that doesn't actually connect up to anything and get your accountant or somebody else that actually does your billing to come directly, take a secured upload and bring it to a secured environment and then contract with the vendor to do that. See, I actually do do this, guys. Okay, so if you can't do it in the electronic space, then the answer is you don't do it. That way when you run through the HIPAA, the FACTA, the FINRA and all the other crap, you haven't done it and we, all we have to do is manage the contract kind of like Los Angeles County's doing. See what I'm saying? And, um, and the, the place that you're going to get bit in terms of real and immediate liability in that situation is the doctor's going to lose his license because he will not have complied with the state privacy rules. The entity's going to have a problem with your state privacy laws, both the HIPAA privacy laws, your state health information privacy, your financial privacy laws, which you guys have a laundry list of. So again, one of those, most of those laws, if you pull them off the electronics and do your electronics differently, that's better. In the case of payment, for example, it might be a good solution for doctors or a small situation is to outsource it to a PayPal equivalent and have a swiping system. And in fact, in today's age, I'm not a big fan of the iPhone because I don't think it's particularly secure, but there's several adaptive things like this. So they swipe their own card. So there's a number of things that you can do there, but the notion here is mitigate the scope of risk by not doing what you can't manage. So let me dovetail, um, Cynthia. I would suggest that you would have to perform some sort of assessment to know where your greater risk is. So, so once you understand what, what those risks are in terms of high, medium, and low, then, I mean, this, what I'm going to say next is something I practice daily because I make some critical decisions almost on a daily basis. It has to be reasonable and defensible. If you could defend it and, it's, and it sounds reasonable, then in, a, in the eyes of the HIPAA compliance or uh, Office of Civil Rights or Department of Health and Human Services, when they come knocking at your door, they have knocked at our door as well, then uh, at least it's reasonable and you could defend it in terms of documentation and you have that assessment to say, here's the risk. It's reasonable to suggest that this is how you mitigate it for that point in time decision. If I can add just one other piece to that, which would help, I think, and then I would invite your things. When I talk about compliance and risk management, because that's what I am, is I'm a, I'm a risk management person. I'm not your usual kind of lawyer. Think about what you do and your organizations do as a juggler. That's the way I think about what you do. You're juggling the ball, and you got a knife, a glass, a baby, <laughs> you know. So what you want to do is you're trying to catch all the balls all the time. But if you have to drop a ball, have a plan for which ball you're going to drop and how you're going to pick it up as quickly as possible. And this is what we do with my clients. And that's the way I would invite you to think about life and what you're doing is understand what balls you're holding. Maybe set one down. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have the balls in air, understand which one is the one that's the most critical to keep up so that if you have to drop something. So today on the East Coast, what we're doing is life and limb. In the World Trade Center, when people are trying to get out, the answer is you get yourself out of the building and everybody else, everything's out on my plate. When you're done with that, just tell everybody that's what you're doing. When you're done with that, come back to me. We'll leave with round two. I can defend that. 
If you would think about that, I don't know if that's helpful. It doesn't sound very legal. Mm -hmm. doesn't sound very lawyerly, but it's true. Think of yourself as the juggler. Don't drop the baby. Yes. Don't drop the baby, unless the baby has a crash helmet on. So, so let me dovetail, or maybe this is a WWF type of thing, <laughs> uh, tag team. So really, there's when you make a decision in terms of risk, there's risk that you will remediate. There's risk that you will uh, accept and monitor where, where, where that you may do some, take some action. And then there's that third risk that you just go and accept it. And that's really based on your risk profile, the culture of the organization, and the expectation of your, uh, of your citizens or consumers, and in this case, patients. So it's where you want to be in that barometer, in that risk barometer. I have a question. Cynthia, my name is John Risk. <laughs> uh, so I should know risk, right? Um, I am interested in um, the trend toward patient-centric healthcare delivery. And, you know, now doctors will call patients after a surgery, well, how are you doing, et cetera, and that seems all compliant to HIPAA. But if uh, they were to use a Skype device or a uh, Internet-based video conferencing solution, whether it's FaceTime or whatever, when does HIPAA, you know, draw the line on when that violates the methodology or the requirement? Well, let me just give my disclaimer that this is an educational emphasis, and I'm not giving any legal advice, um, but I will tell you about the way I teach the people to teach. And the first answer is, is you can eliminate that question if on the front end, if you're going to use those devices, you give an informed disclosure, because if they waive it, both on HIPAA privacy and security, you're okay. So if you're going to use Skype devices, step around the question by getting an authorization, and it would go like this, and I've written them because you'll be able to tell. Dr. Jones really cares about you. And I work on deployed, like for example, I do rural health care things where we're using telemedicine. I've been working on development of these for 20 years in sort of Project COPE, where we have people that live six to 10 hours away from their oncologist. And we're trying to have that real time sort of stuff. And we've been doing it for 20 years. And what we do is say, we'd like to be able to offer you this service. However, there's some technicalities of it. We give them a very clear disclosure, but we have a nice friendly statement. Dr. Jones would like to have the, offer you this opportunity to do this, but in order to do this, you need to have these rules. And here's some paperwork. Here's the process. Would you like to do that? If so, sign this HIPAA compliant, fact of FINRA compliant, state law compliant authorization. And then I don't need to answer that question. And that's one of the things I would say with a little bit of thought up front, if you have somebody that understands what you can do, you can step around that whole question. The vast majority of what I do is try to make the law irrelevant to what you do and only deal with the parts that are within. Now, in terms of that, what kinds of things, if you've already done it and you've screwed up or you think you might have screwed up, because we never admit we screw up until we go through the whole analysis, right? We go through an assessment. The first assessment is, was it for treatment payment or operations purposes? Probably so. But did it meet the security standards? Maybe, maybe not. I don't have an iPhone. I have an iPad that I play words with friends with and take notes on, but I don't conduct business on this toy. And I have a seven-digit multiple-character password on my stupid phone. Okay? Why? Because I have a husband that built the security communications. He says, this is the weakest link. Same issue. And you have just touched on the number one problem we have in healthcare and that is people are using these technologies and they're so accessible and they're so easy and they don't even understand it. So what I would do is go back and run, don't walk, and expand your disclosures to include that and have them opt out and then figure out how you're going to operationalize that. So then, because most people would say it's okay. Is that helpful? So I really, it, the other thing you learn about me is I listen to what you're trying to do, not what the rules are. The rules are the construct that you have to figure out how to fit. So we're playing Dungeons and Dragons here, guys. Okay, and, guys. And that's the answer is see if you can avoid the rule by checking a rule that's an out. Okay, we are out of time, right? Are we? Five more minutes. All right, okay. I got guys in the, in the back, yes. Uh, people can running with mics. Can I dovetail that last question? I just have another spot. Uh, in, in terms of the disclosure, it's really, you got to understand who will initiate that Skype session. You really want to be the one to initiate, not the mm -hmm. other end. And then part of the disclosure, it has to deal with physical security as well. For example, 
you would not want in, no other individuals in that room so that you, it may be a potential HIPAA privacy breach. So it's, it's that language, those well, provisions has to be in the disclosure. Sort of. You do need to do the disclosure broadly because you also have some well, other implications like the caregiver regs and others. So they can have somebody else in the room if they consent. Right. But I think the point is well taken here that comes out of that that is is that really the consent is a beautiful thing. And in fact, think about how you operationalize. And this is literally the stuff I get to do is when you sign into the Skype episode, they have to consent that this thing is there. If you have people that are present, do you consent? Now that, we could still argue, if they had people present, it's okay because they let them stay in the room with them. That's the clarification. But right. the process of one is the catch. And I think that's what's, be you can see also how people like us have to work together to get to the right process. And just regurgitating regulations is not going to help you. Okay, question? I had a, I was very surprised to see that the, um, the only form of data encryption was dealing with data in motion. I am really surprised that you aren't dealing with encrypting the data as soon as it comes into the system and storing it completely encrypted. Um, there is a book that <laughs> is available. There, it was created as a data security best practices for the Life Sciences Information Technology Group that's a working committee of HIMSS. Mm -hmm. And it is a data security best practices and calls out all the regulations, HIP, high tech, NIST, ISO, the whole bit. And I was really surprised to hear that we weren't talking best practices of data being encrypted as soon as it enters your system. That way, if it is breached, there's no breach. I'm not sure that it isn't. If it's electronic and it's PHI, that's not true that there's no breach. There's no breach under the breach notification rules unless it's data, if it's data that's properly encrypted at rest, it's data in motion that's a problem or data that's not properly destroyed under the breach notification rules. But if you look under the HIPAA rules and the, and the fact and FINRA rules, there's breach. We don't do a breach, we say there's a non-compliant use. And one of the biggest problems we have is that a lot of the theft or, or misuse of data is one not electronic at all. It's before it's in the system. So, and that's the biggest issue on the breach notification rules for HIPAA because it already applies there. But the other thing is, and this is where I'm dealing with a lot of the remediation and response, is it's, it's uh, unsecured, it's PHI that is secured, but has been improperly used. So, and it, it, invites, it involves thousands and thousands of pieces of record, but it's not being properly secured, but it's still, it's not being properly used or protected from a privacy rule, security rule standpoint but it is not unsecured PHI, so therefore the breach notification rules don't apply. But you do have the same, you have uh, obligations under the security rule of HIPAA, and you also have obligations under the privacy laws and the data breach laws of the states in every state we're working in. And so what I would say to you is, is that there's a lot of misperception and everybody is focused so much on the breach notification rules on HIPAA. And, that's, and in healthcare, that's, they think, well, we've done that, we've arrived. And they don't even, even understand there's implications beyond if the breach notification rules under the privacy rules, much less that that data is also personal financial information, personal consumer information, personal information that's sensitive, that's the phrase they use, sensitive personal information, which I think go to all of your standards there. And it's just, um, it's that we think, well, the HIP is the highest, but it's really not. Okay, so, so we got two, time for two more questions, guys. I'm sorry. I think uh, yeah. One here. You got one here and one here. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, so I have a question uh, that's related to uh, security breach and uh, most of the security breach in uh, recent years, if you see, uh, especially in uh, military establishment, that happened due to the uh, somebody who was already inside. So whatever the security layers you put for outside that, you know, the person shouldn't get into network and all that, but if the person is already in charge of those kind of data, how do you tackle that kind of scenario? Well, I love this word. We call this data directory management, right? Isn't that the right word? And so what I tell people is what hat are you wearing? The first part of the process that people do across the board, whether it's HIPAA or other, is they fail to do a validation of data directory management, which orients the whole system. So um, I represent a county 
uh, system that is a school district, and it's not Los Angeles, but it's like LA, it's got mental health, it has all these other things, and also the Association of State and Territory Health Organizations will have me do this. And if you looked at my training materials, you would see that step one is what hat are you wearing and what hat are they wearing, and validate and document that in the process. So in the, when you implement the operating system, you have to basically, on the inside, people have inadequately locked down the directory management. And some of our organizations on DOD, not healthcare, but we've carried this over into healthcare. If you don't get privileged at the end of the day by your supervisor that you still have the same privileges, you get locked out the next day. You can't get in the building, you can't get into the records. But it's if you want to do that, and if it's important enough, you can do that. And the same thing's true on the inside here. So what we have with these sort of high profile breaches where somebody hacked in for the stars is a situation in which they have a person who's inside, but they got inside, but they got full at privilege access. Nobody locked them out, they just relied on trust. And sometimes that's all you can accomplish, in which case you have to do a lot of training documentation and penalties when that happens. Does that sort of give you a sense about the answer? But mm -hmm. as I'm saying today is data's boss, and, and the, the number one thing about data security that everybody's weaker or could be stronger on is you gotta lock the house, but not at the door at the point of each point of the stuff. So start with the, start with the stuff and privilege each piece of data up to what you have. Build it backwards on a data basis and don't let them in in the first place unless they've got the privileges and then constantly re-privilege them because directory management is a pain in the, but it's, um, but it's required because the privileges change, but if you don't change them, they're still in and they have the keys to the universe and they can accumulate lifelong privileges that become a problem. So one of the benefits of having an outsourced application is that the in, insider or internal threat is significantly reduced because those relationships are not within your organization. It's hard for somebody within Department X to know who's the server admin or email administrator for an outsourced application. So you, you, you pretty much you cut that relationship and there's no trust between the outsourcer and the individual that have some malicious intent. But you also have to have that social engineering or that helpfulness. So the other part of directory management is, well, you have to also be sure your vendor, right? Your vendor has to have the proper procedures in too because we have that malicious vendor stuff there. But the other part is the workarounds that you talked about that, you know, well, I really can't cover this patient right now, so would you just go down and get this piece of data for me and now they're in as somebody else or or they're putting the data in their pocket, or they're walking around with these everybody shared things, which means it's a very complex process that requires both good systems, good processes, good training, good oversight, and good enforcement. But directory is boss, and it's one of the hardest things to do, I think, in oper operationalizing it, which makes your job challenging. See, lo lucky for me, all I have to do is preach. I'm not actually accountable. You want my job now, don't you? <laughs> And also, too, well, I mean, yeah, you sorry. also just want to look at, you know, if someone does leave an organization, are all those passwords and privileges revoked? Mm -hmm. At what point are they, you know, reviewed? You know, there's some folks when we do an assessment and look at, there's people, that, especially the higher up you go, I think when you get to an administrative level, of course, everything is shanked right away. What about the director of IT over, you know, or someone that's an information security officer that has access and privileges? Uh, as we talked about before, once they're in your network, they can hop around. Um, so if someone does leave an org, let's review those privileges, make sure that they're, you know, disabled and, and not, you know, allowing someone once they walk out the door to get back into your system. Uh, how does HIPAA and PCI look at this movement to the cloud where now you have complete records and applications being delivered from the clou cloud as opposed to being owned and retained on premise? And what does the practitioner have to do to make sure they're in compliance? Well, you know, I'm actually, everybody thinks I'm on a cloud, but apparently I'm not on a cloud. Somebody asked me to come and talk about five years ago about cloud computing, and, I, and I've been on a virtual system for 20 years. I've been paperless for 20 years. And so I said, well, I'd be happy to talk about that, except I don't know what a cloud is. And they explained to me what a cloud is, and so I went home to my husband who's built my operating system. I left the big law firms because I was so paranoid about the inadequacies of their data. It was driving my husband nuts, so he said, I'll just build something that I really don't understand, but it meets all the requirements because I have to go through the same process you do because I work for all you all. And the answer is, 
you go through the same privileging and there's differences in the data. So I actually have a, a hard system cloud I and mean, I have a hard system just like you do. I have a server, so I'm not really up on the cloud. And every time we look at letting somebody else host our data, you know, my husband looks like Inspector Gadget, okay? Cause, because it's beyond his control. He can't audit it effectively. But with my clients, we do to use those data on the cloud, and we don't actually back it up electronically every day. Somebody takes my data to the backup system, so I'm on a 24-hour backup, which I wanted real time, but he said that was another $75,000 a year, and I can't have that. And so when you're doing the cloud, you've got to think about not only who's hosting it, what's the security, what's the reliability, all the same things that you have to do there. But they assume that. In fact, if you look at prescription, e-prescribing, there's an assumption that you're going to have a cloud. You have to look at the end-to-end, -end, so now you've got a warehouse somewhere else. But you also have to think about what's the transmission to the warehouse and where's the security lines there. And the answer is to me is there's not a right or wrong answer. There's a process and you have to re-credential, remanage it. And each one of them is going to have places that you guys know better than I do. I just ask the questions and help you document it. That's stronger or weaker. And when you have those weaknesses, then you have to build in place what is your process to prevent that or mitigate that, to oversee it, to audit it, and, and to tighten it up. And what's your disaster response when you find something to clean it up to do it? And the cloud is no different than anything else for that. The value of the cloud is, in people's mind, is that the amount of data and what we have to keep and the cost effectiveness of doing it is perceived to be much cheaper there than in a warehouse at Iron Mountain. And I, I frankly do agree with that, especially you have multiple clouds. And by the way, I have multiple data sites, which also drives everybody nuts. So same process, same question, different application for me. So, guys, I, we really are out of time. Uh, we're pushing our live time here. Um, I've been, you know, told a few times to close it out. Uh, but I still want to leave one thought in your heads when we go. Um, I, did a, I did an article in a presentation on security in the cloud, and people thought mobility and people were talking about everything else. But people really did not understand it's nothing about the device. It's about the data. That's the whole premise and what I talked about and it was very, it was something that people really got energized around because they realized that it's not, a, you can, you know, your, your phone is replaced every two years. Um, your PC is replaced every three years. Your um, VMware sitting here, everything is getting virtualized. Um, it's not about the device. It's not about the people, it's about the data and how the people and the data collide. And it could be in the cloud, collision happens and then there is sandy and there is storms. All right, let's go. Uh, thank you guys, uh, thank, you for, uh, uh, thank you for the great panel. <clears throat> I think